God is good. He's the healer. And what's awesome is that God cares about us. He does. I don't know why. We're just little people. But he does. He put us here for a purpose. And he cares about us. A challenge for you. A challenge for you. If you haven't already done so. But be careful. Pray for the compassion of Christ. And then get ready to cry. And have people be around you that you can minister to. It changes things. And then you need to do it again. When you start getting irritated at, at people. Pray again for the compassion of Christ. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. Okay, folks. We are now entering chapter 5. Ethan, you missed out on our, on our whole seminary of demonic, uh, whatever you call it, casting. Remember, you had asked me about it. You're like, oh, when you get into chapter of the next section, you're gonna, how deep are you going to go with um, the whole thing about you know, deliverance? I went deep, but you weren't here. So it's on YouTube. You've got to go back on YouTube. Basically, the name of Jesus... And the power of the Holy Spirit casts out demons. That's a nutshell. Now you don't even have to watch it. That's the last one. Okay, so we're actually in session number 12. And we are entering into chapter 5. So if you're following along online, you can catch up real easy. That's only four chapters of Luke that you, that you need to go through. And uh, you can also uh, go back uh, through the Facebook feed. You'll find... The previous ones and also some YouTube links um, where I've cut out just the teaching part and then those are on a playlist on my YouTube channel so you can find all of them okay so when we last left off Jesus ha- was beginning his ministry <clears throat> where he walked around and, and he went around and, and taught and preached and he began in the region of uh, Galilee And if you recall, he went to his hometown and he read from the book of Isaiah and basically said, this is me. This is, I am fulfilling this. The the scripture is fulfilled in me. And they said, get out of here. And they tried to push him off a cliff and kill him. His own people that he grew up with. Other than the town of Nazareth, he was accepted throughout the region. And he went and he preached and he taught and he healed. And then he kind of settled in Capernaum. And if you remember, um, we put a map up. And if you don't remember, you can imagine in your head from the maps that you've seen in the Bible, the Sea of Galilee, which has different names. And we're going to talk about the Sea of Galilee. It has a special shape. So it's named Sea of other things, too. One of them is the word for like a harp. Um, But it's kind of like a diamond shape or triangular shape and Capernaum where Jesus moved to for a while was located at the top end of uh, the Sea of Galilee where the Jordan River emptied into the Sea of Galilee so if you know anything about fishing Marv where's the best place to fish in a lake right where it feeds in those fish are like come on bring me something to eat and it brings in the nutrients and kind of grubs and whatever. And so that was kind of the hot spot for, for fishing in the Sea of Galilee. And so Capernaum's there. I guess there's not very many um, towns now around and settlements around the Sea of Galilee today. Capernaum and I think Tiberias are still there, but it's, um, it's actually surprisingly desolate around. I would have thought that this place would be packed, but it's not. But in, in Jesus' day, it was. it was. There was a whole economy that was going on there. So we go into chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Jesus is going to call the first disciples 
I'm so excited. Are you ready? Here we go. So it was, as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God, that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret, which is the Sea of Galilee, Galilee, and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, who is also, that's another name for Peter, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let your nets down for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. That's a lot of fish. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all, and followed him. So, verses 1 and 2. The fishing boats by the lake of Gennesaret. That's another name for the Sea of Galilee. Also called Lake Tiberias. And there's a few other names that it was, that it was called. Um, it says that Jesus saw two boats. So, these boats, one, at least one, was owned by Peter and his dad. So we, I talked about this in a recent sermon. Um, Peter and his dad were partners in a fishing business. And they had other partners who were James and John. That was their business partners. And so they're sitting there, this is daytime, and they're parked, their boats are parked up against the shore. Oh, before we go any farther, to give some context to this, no, not yet, not yet. We're going to look at some pictures in just a minute. So Jesus gets into this boat because the crowd's pressing him. So he's basically up against the edge of the lake, and these people are just like trying to touch him, and who is him? And they're pushing from the back, and they keep pushing him. So he steps into this boat and asks Peter, just put me out a little bit for the shore so I can have some breathing room and I, can, and I can teach. And then he sits down in the boat and teaches. So the boats are empty because it's daytime. The fishermen would fish at night. They would fish at night and they fished with nets. And during the day then they would clean these nets. There's uh, three main types of um, fishing that, that's done in this lake. They still do the exact same methodology of fishing as they've done it for 2,000 years. They still do the same thing. Um, and they still use the same type of nets. Um, they even have found hooks, fishing hooks from back in this time. At, but you didn't often fish with a hook. Usually you fished with um, nets. And they would do this during the, um, they do this, the fishing at night. And I'll, we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit more. But the, the economy was pretty significant in the region for fishing. Fishing was a major part of it. Uh, I was reading a, a, a paper by, by a, um, uh, it was a, a professor, and she was talking about how this is something that's never really been discussed as much as it probably should have, because we see um, fishing and fish references all through the gospel. Those, uh, Jesus called, you know, fishers of men, and there's the fish sign that, you know, was the, the secret sign of, of a Christian, and there, over and over again, there is references to fish, and uh, her, her paper, research paper, was kind of about the economy of the region, and how important fishing was, and how it really should be a kind of imp more important to us in terms of the gospel. But there's so much. I mean, there's so much to cover. And again, we are out of 
We are out of the context. We're 2,000 years away and thousands of miles away. So um, it's good to kind of think about what was going on day to day, day to day. So here's these guys that are laboring. They're, they're fishing, and this is hard work because they, they would fish at night, um, and, then they, and then during the day, they had to repair and do all these things with their nets, and they had to sell their fish. I'm not sure when they slept, <laughs> but it wasn't very often. As a, as a business uh, owner, I can relate. <laughs> you don't sleep very often sometimes because there's work to do, and you got to do it, and you got to pay the bills. So that's what they were doing. They were paying the bills. The fish they would catch were a type of tilapia. They were called uh, tilapia, or now they're called tilapia galilea. That's the scientific name. So um, you can go buy a tilapia. I actually, yesterday I bought tilapia fish at Sherbs. They were frozen. It's good, because it's kind of good low calorie uh, food. Um, so it's a, uh, th and this is a freshwater lake, by the way. It's not salt water. So there was a tilapia galilea, which is now called, do you know what it's called? What do people call it? St. Peter's fish. Yeah. So we we'll have some pictures. So put up these pictures. We'll go one at a time. I think I've got like four of them. This is modern, obviously. That's the Sea of Galilee, and here's a modern fishing boat. Um, the only real difference in these type of boats from then is they got motors instead of sails. Go to the next one. And here's some guys. These are probably not tilapia. These are pretty big. This, I think this is a different kind of fish, um, but this is current. Um, there's a guy processing his fish, and they still do it the same, same thing by hand. Go to the next one. And this would be representative of the boat that Jesus would have got into. So this is um, maybe either a reconstruction or maybe this is a, a current, you know, boat that somebody has, but they were, they were small and kind of narrow and maybe uh, probably kind of flat bottom so that they could pull up into the shadow, the shallows because they didn't use boat docks. Okay, next one. St. Peter's fish. So til tilapia. Looks familiar, doesn't it? Like, uh, like a like a crappy up in the Cooper Creek, similar. But apparently, these guys don't they they don't have very many bones, and you can just they're 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 kind of flat, and you can just throw them in a frying pan and just kind of fry them, turn it over, fry it, and there you go, you're done. Think about this. I mean, Jesus was eating these fish on the, on the seashore. It's funny, you know, because after this happened, you know, when, when Jesus was crucified, then Peter was like, okay, I guess I'm going to go be a fisherman again. And life's, you know, I thought I had this great thing, but I'm going to go back to what I was doing, back to fishing. So he went back there and he's fishing. And then Jesus comes and has some fish with him. They kind of did the full circle thing. Pretty cool. Okay, so verse 3 says that he got into Simon Peter's boat and asked him to push him out a little bit. So we notice from this that, that as we kind of stated that the crowds are pushing in on him. But so these crowds are all pushing in and they're listening to what he has to say. They want to get healed. They want a part of him. But what's Peter and, and his partners doing? They're working. They're, they're getting, they got, they got business to take care of. So Jesus asks him, can you take me out? And from the language in here, you can tell that it's not just Peter and his boat. He, I think he's got some employees in there. But he says, yeah. He has respect for Jesus. He's a rabbi, teacher, calls him master. And he says, sure, I'll, you get in my boat. I'll, I'll lose some money for the next hour while you yak. And he's probably still working on his, on his nets. Because these, these nets that they used, one of the style of fishing that they did was they were, they were throw nets, and they were, uh, they'd throw them, and then they'd kind of drag them. They'd actually take them out. There was a type that they would take out in a boat, 
they'd set them out there and then from shore they'd pull them in. But the way these, these um, nets were designed, they'd tear all apart. So at the, with the fish that they'd get in them, then they'd have to mend them all day and dry them. So hours of doing that. So that's what Peter's doing. So he's probably just sitting in the boat. He said, yeah, I'll row you out. And he rows out a little bit, drops his anchor, and then he's probably just, you know, working. And Jesus is doing his thing. And I'm sure he's listening. And his employees are probably listening as well. And Jesus is teaching. Then so Jesus kind of wraps this up. And he says, Peter, take me out in the deep water and let your nets down. So that's not how you fished. That's not how you did it. Okay? This is what a noob would tell you. Right? They, they said, hey, Marv, it's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Let's go fishing. Um, Marv's going to say, well, that's not really when you catch fish. It, yeah, it, but if you want to, I'll take you out, right? You're going to be nice to him. Be nice to the noob. So Jesus says, let's go out in the, go out in the deep water. Let's drop your nets over. Then he just got done mending, right, and drying. The, the, these fishermen, they're, again, they're using drag nets, which you... Which, you pull, and they're not designed to catch fish in deep water. They're actually designed to catch fish in the shallow water. The reason that they fished at night is because fish have tiny brains, but they are smart enough to know that you need cover. If, if you're a fish and you swim around in, in shallow water in the daylight, guess what happens to you? You get killed <laughs> because the birds can see you and then they're like, oh, food. And they go and they grab you. So birds kill off all the real dumb ones before, you know, before too long. The, the big ones, you find those way down. Those are the smart ones. They're big because they're smart. They figured out how to survive, which is you got to go to cover. Or so in the daytime, there's an, and we've seen the picture of this lake. There's not like logs all around there, which is where you would find fish underneath those. There's nothing. There's no structure. So they just go deep during the day. And then at night, they would come up in the shallows. And so that's why the fishermen would fish in the shallows. As an aside, because we'll see this later on, when I was researching the different type of fishing that they're doing, there's another cool type where it's a, it's a small throw net and it's not very big around, but they throw it over the top of fish and it's weighted and it sinks to the bottom. And the, then the fisherman actually dives to the bottom of the lake and pulls the fish out of the net, puts them in a bag and swims back. And they, they do it stark naked. So there is a passage in scripture where it talks about that Peter ran out to, to see you know, Jesus and he wasn't dressed. This is why, because they would, they'd, they'd fish naked. They'd, they'd dive in there. They're not doing that right now. They're fully clothed. <laughs> I just thought that was kind of a cool story. Uh, and the picture of the throw net was pretty cool. And they still fish like that too. I'm gonna try that at Cooper Creek. Uh, but not naked, we don't, not that part. So again, it does look like uh, in verse four and five, it appears that some of his employees were in a boat with him because in verse six, six it says they, that, that they dealt with this fish. So, so he, tells, uh, he tells, Peter tells this to Jesus when Jesus says, hey, let's go out in the deep water and drop your net. Let's do some fishing. And Peter, being respectful of the master, the rabbi, he says, well, we fished all night. Um, but nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. That's a good response to a request from Jesus. I don't understand, and it doesn't make any sense to me. Nevertheless, you have asked me, and I will do it. Maybe that's what Jesus liked about one of the things he liked about Peter so much. Peter, he's a guy. He's a manly man. He said, that doesn't make sense to me, but I'm going to do it because you asked me to. 
It's a faith test. Have you ever had a faith test? Where your faith was tested? And maybe you failed? Which I have done. But guess what? God gives you more chances to pass the test. We get lots of faith tests. Okay, verses 6 and 7, the great catch. Peter and his helpers in the boat drop the net over the side in the middle of the day where there shouldn't be catching any fish. And they catch so many fish that the net starts to break. And they have to signal to James and John, their partners that are out there in their boat, guys, get over here, we need help. And they fill both of the boats so much that they start to sink. You saw those fish, they're kind of little fish. That's a lot of fish. I don't even know that the nets could really handle that many fish. And they're pulling them in, the, the boats are starting to sink. So not only does God bless their obedience, Jesus blesses their obedience when they did what he asked, even though it didn't seem like it made sense, which we see all through scripture over and over again, but he does so in a way that exceeds their needs. They probably never, ever, nobody ever caught so many fish that your boat started to sink. That didn't happen. So they had a miracle happen. Peter recognizes this. He recognizes that this is not just a master fisherman who happened to know where the school was. This is a God thing. This is a, this is a miracle. So verse 8 to 9, Peter falls to his knees. It might, it might still be difficult for us to grasp the magnitude of this miracle. And I was kind of thinking about this because, again, this is Peter's profession. He's been doing this. His, his dad is his business partner. How long do you think Peter's been fishing? Probably since he was about this big. He, that, he knows it. He knows, he knows where the fish are. He knows what time you do it. He knows how you throw your nets. He knows about how many fish you're going to catch. He knows what the average is going to be. He knows everything. He knows how many taxes you got to pay off your fish because you had to pay taxes to the Romans on your fish. He knows it all. He's an expert. And Jesus does a miracle that he gets. He gets that this is a miracle. I was thinking about that because sometimes, um, I mean, we can, we can understand it, you know, like, wow, yeah, lots of fish and there shouldn't have been that many fish. But it was very specific to, to a fisherman. They would know. And if there's something you're really, really good at and you're super into, then when you'd see that, then you'd be like, oh, yeah, I get it. Maybe not everybody else is going to understand the magnitude. It's kind of like when, uh, when Joni got healed of... Um, vertigo to me that was really incredible because I had gone to be at her side at the hospital so like I had a, a real understanding um, more than if I just knew that she had vertigo like I had gone there and seen the, res the, the results and the symptoms and how messed up she was and then to see that happen so to me it ramped it up it ramped it up so for Peter this is like Yes, this is awesome. And he understands, wow, this is not just an incredible guy. This is, God is involved in this. He understood that Jesus was not just another teacher. He wasn't just another rabbi. And it says, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He was convicted. He understood that he was in the presence of the Holy One. And he instantly realized he was unworthy. He was a sinful man. And he was convicted of his own sinful nature. So I was thinking about our response 
to a move of God. If we're, if we're seeking, if we understand, it's, it's like that. If we understand this is God, we go down on our knees and we're convicted. But there's some differences between us and Peter in those, in those cases. What are they? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, and I and I was thinking that um, at the time, if you were convicted of your sin, what are you going to do about it? You know, yes, I'm a sinful man, and they have to go, you know, do the sacrifices and and. I just don't think we can understand, fully understand the difference that we have with Jesus who died for our sin and ended the system of having to go and do these sacrifices to be forgiven. Jesus just starts forgiving people and then he dies for all of our sins once and for all. So, yes. I was listening to that book that I was telling you about just a little bit ago, and they actually referenced this uh, passage when he was talking about it. Um, And uh, he says that it's a very common occurrence that when people come into the contact of the true goodness of God, that it is often convicting and makes us knowledgeable about our sin and our own. Hmm. and that there is a healthy amount of disparity about our sin that is relevant to the Christian, though we ne- don't necessarily dwell in it and over-focus on it, but if we don't have a continuous acknowledgement of our sinfulness, we tend to lose sight of the goodness that God is for forgiving yeah. it on a continual basis. Yeah. Paul said, I die daily. So... Until we, until we uh, reach perfection, right, which is, is not going to happen here, then we continue still to live in a sin nature, and it's an interesting thing and a, and a larger discussion. But, but yeah, I think that we have to struggle with that. If we stop struggling with it, something's, something's wrong. I think we need to be continuously convicted of... Um, like I was thinking this morning, I blew it. And then I, I, got, con- and I got convicted of my little thing, blowing it, asked forgiveness, and I knew I'm forgiven. And that's nice. That I just don't have to just like keep on going like that. Now, there's also pain in that because it's like, why do I keep blowing it? <laughs> am I the only one? I am. Oh, oh no. <laughs> That's who, it's who we are still. And there are teachers who tell you that that is not the case. That like, there are teachers out there that are very popular, that have big followings who tell you that you, you're, uh, you when you're saved, you're, you're, you're sinless now. And they will tell you, I don't sin anymore. I, uh, there's one guy, very popular guy, he says, I haven't thought of a woman inappropriately in 25 years. I'm going to say that that is not honest, that, that that is just not true. And the problem is that it creates an issue for the followers of these people who say, yes, me as well, but every day. They have thoughts that they cannot control. You could fight them. You have to. You subdue your mind, right? But you still, they still come in. You have inappropriate thoughts, sinful thoughts, you, have, you, you make mistakes, you speak in anger, you cannot go through your life in, in, in these bodies, in this sin world, and not, and not do that. And to teach people that you can is super damaging, and I know some of them, and they struggle with this so hard. 
because they just think, man, uh, there's something wrong with me. I can't do it. Why can't I do it? And this guy I follow does it. It's because the guy is lying. That's not scriptural. Off topic. You just touched on something that fires me up. I don't like that. I don't like seeing people get put in bondage from terrible, terrible systems of religion. Okay. Verse 10. Fishers of men. So Jesus tells them that they're going to catch men from now on. James and John were fishing partners with Peter, and they were there to help the boat. So they saw this going on. Jesus tells Peter, who has fallen to his knees, don't be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. Instead of fish, Peter is going to be harvesting people for the kingdom of God. You know what's interesting about Peter, and probably with all of us, is that the experiences that he had with Jesus and in his life before, you can see them in his writing. Yeah, with Jesus' conversation with him about the rock, and, and I mean, I really studied about that when I uh, did a sermon on, on the, the, the stones, and that is out of First Peter, and he is using the imagery of rocks and stones because, I mean, his name that, you know, Jesus called him is, is rock and stone, and Jesus dealt with him about this and talked to him about the stumbling stone, and, and um, it, it's, it's interesting. So the, the, the things that Jesus told Peter and the imagery that he gave him and the lessons that he taught him stuck with him forever. And I'll bet you that that started right here with this fishers of men. You're going to catch men. And he did. Thousands. Thousands and thousands. We see that in Acts. 3,000, then 5,000. He's speaking, preaching the gospel, catching men for Christ, casting the net. It's awesome. Yes. I never thought about this before, but I was thinking as you was talking about the miracle of the fish that I don't have any idea if Peter thought about, well, if I leave my, I, I got, I got, I'm going with Jesus, but what's going to happen with my family? Yeah. But God supplied in this miracle for his family to have plenty of finances. Oh, yeah. To purchase new boats, You're right. grow their business, new more more employees, whatever, yeah. and live. So that was an awesome thing. God yeah. cares about all of us, I and mean, He just doesn't care about the one He calls. He calls. He cares about the whole family yeah. of that one. And that's a great point. Yeah, that's a great point because you you're looking beyond the cool thing of His boat being full of fish. He sold fish, so with a boat full of fish. How many years of catch was that? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So God provided for him, and his business partners were there too, so they could say, now we, we had that great catch, we're good to go. So that, makes, that ties right into the next part here, verse 11. They forsook all and followed him. Now, I don't know if you were here and you remember the message that I gave on church hurt and I was studying this right here and the word is FEMA and that means they dropped it they dropped their nets they dropped everything and and they they forsook it they left it so that's what it means in the context here is that they were done with that life now they're following Jesus So that should be our response to God's call as well. If you are hearing his voice, the message for you is that God's calling you and you have a choice. You're going to answer it or ignore it. 
So we should be, we should be ready to, to forsake everything and follow too. But it's scary to think about. But that's, that's what the call of Christ is. And for some of us, for most of it, does, it doesn't mean that you, you're called to drop your business and everything and walk away. And for some of us, you are. Okay, so we're going to the next section. Verses 12 through 16, and this is of uh, Jesus heals a man with leprosy. So chapter 5, verses 12 through 16. And it happened when he was in a certain city that, behold, a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus, and he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. So verses 12 to 13, it's, it says a man full of leprosy. And what's interesting is that Luke, as the physician, emphasizes the, the severity of the case. So he didn't, doesn't just say the man had leprosy. He says he was full of leprosy. So it's like the physician's description of this is a severe case of leprosy. The man falls on his face in front of Jesus and he says, and I, 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 this stood out to me, he says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, I am willing. This is an interesting prayer. It's a great prayer. The prayer is, Lord, if it is your will, you, you can do it. If it is your will, you can do it. We pray for the will of God to be done. Why would we want anything other than the will of God to be done? So, what is leprosy in the Bible? This is an interesting topic. Yes, metaphor for sin. And um, at the time, it was, I mean, it was more than a metaphor. At the time when Jesus was walking, if you had leprosy, without a doubt, you sinned. That from perspective of, of society and the Jewish people, you, you were a sinner. That was, that was the sign that you were a sinner. Um, so actual leprosy, what we call leprosy now is actually called Hansen's disease, and it's a bacterial infection. It's a chronic skin infection. It's caused uh, by a bacteria called Mycobacterium leprae, and it's treatable now with a multi-drug therapy they give you over six months to a year. For this guy, it would be a year because he has a severe case. If you had less severe case, you'd be six months. You, uh, you'd get three drugs called Dapsone, Rif Rifem Rifampicin and clofazimine. These are probably like twenty, thirty thousand dollars each drugs. I'm sure that's how the drug companies go. Um, but in this day, there were no antibiotics. There's no creams. That nothing like that. So this was an interesting little bit of research they did on leprosy because. There's so many experts out there on everything. Now the experts contradict the other experts. <laughs> so some of them say something for sure and some of them other ones say this thing for sure. So um, I was reading from one site and I did a bunch of write up on it and then, then I realized then I got to thinking about it a little bit and I thought, I don't think they're quite 100% correct on this. Um, Hansen's disease was not necessarily the leprosy of the Bible. Now, one researcher, well, not more than one researcher, many researchers think that 
Leprosy was a term that was just widely used for skin conditions. So if you had psoriasis, you had, you know, whatever, um, it'd, be, it'd be leprosy. Yeah. 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 So, but when I went back and looked at Leviticus, Leviticus, um, the prescription and the diagnosis for, Levi for leprosy, biblical leprosy, is actually found in Leviticus 13. And it's very, very specific. And guess who was the, the official diagnoser of, le of leprosy? It was the priest. You'd go to the priest, and the priest would get out Leviticus 13, and it'd be like, does it have white spot and white hair? Yes. Does it, did, if the hair of the diseased areas turn white and the disease appears to be deeper than the skin, okay, it's leprosy, checks off the box. If your skin, if your hair didn't turn white on the spot, then you go in quarantine for seven days, and then you come out and you get re-examined. And if it did, then, and you came out, and then you were clean, and you go in for another seven days and get, just to be safe, and then you'd have to go back to the priest, and if you, got, if you got it, and you got healed from it, or you thought you got healed, then you had to go back to the priest. So that's why Jesus is telling this guy, uh, in, in here he tells him to go see the priest. But, but so the more study that I, that, that I did biblically, it seemed to kind of rule out um, some of what I had read on actually a, a, a site that was like, it's the International Leprosy Site. I don't think they were quite right. I don't think that biblical leprosy was actually Hansen's disease. It could be, but Hansen's disease doesn't turn your hair white over the spot. So it's, it's interesting and it doesn't matter. <laughs> what matters is that, as you said, it was a, it was a uh, symbol that, uh, of sin. So it was kind of like a walking, um, it's kind of like, you know, you have the prophets, some prophets that had to do weird things, like one guy had to like lay on his side, burn his hair and burn dung and all these weird, I wouldn't want to be that prophet. <laughs> Actually, I don't know if that you'd want to be any of the prophets because they had pretty tough jobs and, and a, a lot of scary stuff and you had to be a spirit to have your head chopped off. But uh, some of them had to do like really specific like uh, um, actions, you know, that were, that were symbolic that would mean something. And it's kind of like um, leprosy was a symbol of, of sin. And then it had to be treated in this very specific way. It diagnosed in a very specific way. But if you had it, if you had what was considered by the priest to say, you have leprosy, boy, if you read Leviticus 13, it's pretty depressing. To find out what you had to do, basically, your normal life was done. You could not stand, oh, this is freaky, I'm just realizing this. So you couldn't stand within six feet of it, somebody, Remember when we had the little six-foot tapes in the... I got chewed out in Bimark because I, I got in the wrong line. The line goes down the, down the aisle, sir. Sorry. <laughs> Some ladies that had been waiting, you know, at their six-foot tapes. And I, I was just like, oh, cool, there's room here. I'll stand here. Six foot, you had to stay six feet apart. And this is freaky. I'm just realizing this. You had to cover your... You're the top of your lip. I don't quite understand it. You, you had to let your hair out and be unkempt and let it come down over your face, but you had to cover your top lip. Doesn't that sound like a mask, a face mask? Oh, man. <laughs> I didn't realize that when I was looking at it, but it's, it's, I'm just being kind of silly here, but you had to do these things. I don't know what the, the lip covering thing was, but you had to cover your lip. Then you had to say, unclean, unclean, and you couldn't go within six, you couldn't even go within six feet of your own family member. You, when it came to your family, you're done. Like they could put stuff out for you and you could go live it, but you could not live with them. You had to go live in a leper colony. Everybody hated you. Yes, well, they were, they were whole quarantines of a societies. So you, you would, could, you, if you, if the priest said, 
I'm sorry, man, you have leprosy, then that's it. You had to go live with the other lepers. And actually, this site, I apologize, because the site that I was reading, the International Lepers, Leprosy something or other, they said, don't use the word leper. And they said that they're petitioning the writers of the Bible, which the Bible's already written, but in future versions, they would like you to not, the, the Bible to not say leper. They would like to say a leprous person. Now, it seems kind of silly, but I actually understand what they're saying because they are a society who treats leprosy worldwide. And what their point was is that the word leper has become a derogatory term internationally. We don't ever hear it because we don't really deal with leprosy here. In a, we're not a third world country. But there are countries where there's still leprosy, there's still polio, there's still all these things and people say that they're gone. No, they're not. They're just they're in these other countries and they're treatable. But we're, by the grace of God, we live here in the U.S. of A. We don't have to be scared of leprosy and just COVID. You just have to be scared of COVID. Very scared. I'm just kidding. Oh, and on a windy day, you, ha you couldn't get within 150 feet of anybody because then your germs would blow. Yes. Oh, that's right. You probably have, you have a leprosy wind, wind finger, a sock. So in verse... Uh, Oh, the, the website that I was, one of the ones that I was looking at was called the Leprosy Mission International. In verse 13 to 15, um, it describes that Jesus heals this man. Jesus said, I am willing, be clean. And the man was healed immediately, which we see when Jesus heals, it's done. Jesus tells him to go straight to the priest as instructed in Leviticus, and he also tells him not to tell anybody, which never seems to work out in the gospel when Jesus says, now don't tell anybody what just happened to you. But, so the word gets out, the word about Jesus spread, everybody wants to hear him teach and be healed by him. Wouldn't you? Do you now? I do. Verse 16, Jesus often went into the wilderness to be alone and pray. So everywhere he's going, crowds are on him. And he's, he's growing in fame and, and you know, because these people, they want to they wanna come and see this guy who heals. And, and so when they do, they crowd into him, they bring him people to heal, they want to be healed. They, they touch him, they get up in, you know, up in his face where he has to get on a boat to even be able to, to speak to him. So it's overwhelming. And he was a man in a physical body, just like us. He had the same weaknesses, physical weaknesses that, that we have. He could get exhausted, and he did get exhausted. And there's something exhausting about ministry. So there are times, and it's not all the time, but there's times, um, times of worship, times of prayer, when the Spirit of God moves, times when, when I get to preach, I'm done. <laughs> when that's done, I got to go sit in a chair because I'm... Like, if, if it was, if the Spirit of God was moving in the way that I always hope and pray that He does, it's so exciting, but it's so exhausting. It takes, it takes everything out of you. And you, worship leaders know the same, the same thing. Um, the more incredible that you, that you notice that the, the, Spirit, the Holy Spirit is moving, the more sapping it is of your human physical strength. And so Jesus, can you imagine what he is dealing with every day? Just, you know, healing and giving and 
the Holy Spirit's moving through him and it's power, it's great power. Uh, remember when he, the woman touched his garment and he said, I felt some of my power go out of me. And he didn't even know, you know, he just knew that somebody had done that. And so he's doing that every day. So he's got to go recharge, man. He's got to go spend time alone with God and prayer. And, and so he goes into the wilderness to be alone and pray. Which is something that we should all be able to do. And is to have a spot where you can go uh, or a time that you, can, that you can do it. Some of us foresters, it's like, we don't have to, well, now I kind of have to try because I'm not in the woods all the time, but you know, um, you're out in the woods all the time. There are times when you just like, you just fall down and pray in the middle of the woods, right? Yeah. Oh yeah, lonely places. Yeah, no distractions. Um, that's you know that's the hard part of our lives now. Where can you go when you get no distractions? Sometimes it's like you know, um, for me it's early mornings. Um, if I can be disciplined, and I, to be honest, I'm not disciplined every single day. I have to, I have to when I when I get up, I grab my coffee and I go and I want to spend time in the Word. And if, I, if I'm not careful and I accidentally push the wrong button on my tablet, I'm on the internet, I'm on Facebook, and then, or whatever, and I'm like, darn it. Because <laughs> now I gotta finish this, then go back. But it's like, I, it has to be the first thing. It has to be the first thing. And if it is, it's actually, like, even if I feel like I can't open my eyes, it's refreshing. And and, and it's and it just, even if it's just, uh, you know, open, open the Bible app and what it, the first verse that comes up, whatever, that's the one that you're going to read. Or maybe you're, do, maybe you're going verse by verse. I, I usually have like multiple like ideas and little studies going on and then I get distracted and do a different study or, or whatever. But those times are really important and, and times of prayer. And so um, if, you're, if, you, if you haven't developed that into your life, I, I would just encourage you to do that. That's something that Jesus modeled for us. And I think it's really important to your, to your walk and actually really helps you just mentally and as well um, to spend time in, in prayer. And um, that's all. So... I think we're going to just, we're going to cut it off there and we will continue next time with verses 17 through 26, which is a cool story about guys tearing somebody's roof apart to bring somebody in for healing. <laughs> good friends, good buddies who will tear somebody else's house apart for you. We all need friends like that. So... Be blessed. Um, glad that Johnny made it through surgery. Everybody have a great night, and we'll see you um, Sunday morning at 1030. Okay. Good night. <laughs>